Hello, hope you had a lovely weekend. I thought I'd try and use my wand to do some of the nasty writing for me this morning, but it seems to be malfunctioning, so I might have to use the old fashioned way. I think I need to get some new um, Phoenix tail feathers or something from Ollivander's in Diagon Alley, and then maybe my wand will work again. So I'm gonna leave that today and use my whiteboard pen instead. So yeah, as I said, hope you had a lovely weekend. Welcome back to Monday morning. Hope you're feeling refreshed and rested and ready for some more atmospheric Diagon Alley narrative story writing. Um, before we start today, let's have a look at our nasty writing for today, our nasty writing task. I'm gonna come the other side so you can see it a bit better. Um, today, we're thinking about similes and metaphors. Why do we use similes and metaphors in our descriptive writing? Have a little think. Do we just use them because the teacher has told us to and it's on the success criteria? What's the point of them? Why do poets use them? Why do writers of stories use them? Well, let's see what answer my board comes up with. To paint a vivid picture and create atmosphere for the reader. So this is what we've been talking about a lot over the last week or two, the last week really, um, in terms of creating our Diagon Alley story. Creating a picture for the reader. So almost like you are describing the action in a film and the reader can see it in their mind's eye. What's the difference between the two then? Now I don't think you need to be overly worried about remembering the difference between a simile and a metaphor. It is something you probably have to do more and more when you go to high school, when you're looking at poetry or looking at descriptive writing. But in your writing in year six, as long as you're trying to use some great description in your writing and you've got a simile or a metaphor in your writing, it doesn't matter too much if you're not sure which one you've used as, as long as you've used one of them. So what is the difference between the two? A simile, I think lots of you will be saying this out loud as I'm talking, a simile describes something by comparing it to something else. And the way we can spot similes is they often use the word like or as. So for example, the snow was as soft as cotton wool. That would be a simile. It's not a very good one, sorry. But uh, we've used the word as there. Okay, and a metaphor is very similar, really. But a metaphor can be a word or a phrase. And remember, a phrase is just a group of words. A word or a phrase which describes something by saying that it is something else. So um, I know in my class in 6SJ, we've often said the sun was a fiery red ball in the sky. Well, we all know it isn't a fiery red ball, but we're saying it is to create that really strong, powerful image for the reader. So your nasty writing task today is to write some sentences describing the scene below. Now, I know that might not be as clear for you on this video, but there is a nasty writing task sheet, as usual, on the daily learning page. So um, you should be able to see it bigger if you open that up. This is actually a scene from Harry Potter. Some of you might recognise it from one of the films. I can't remember which one. So I am going to think of a sentence I can use that includes a simile or a metaphor. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to describe the deer here. I think in the books, in the films, this is actually called a Patronus and it represents, um, I think it's, is it Harry's father or mother? I'm sure you're all shouting at the screen, no, it doesn't do that, but I can't remember exactly, but it represents one of his parents. Um, so I'm going to start by describing the deer. I haven't got much space here, so my lines are going to be quite short. I'm going to talk about the deer's um, the silhouette, the shadow of the deer. So the deer's silhouette, it's not really a silhouette though, because I can see all of it. Deer's, it's not a shadow, this is its shadow, isn't it? Um, what word could I use? Image? Because it does look a bit like an image in a photograph, doesn't it? The deer's image, now I think, if I look at that, how can I describe it? It's glistening, it's shining, it's silver, it's reflecting in the water. So I've got all those ideas in my head. 
And so what I need to do is just write them down, just have a go. I can always edit it and make it better afterwards. So the deer's image was a, I like the word glistening actually, a glistening silver um, statue. That's the word I had in my head, I've just remembered. Because it stood so still and motionless, it looks like a statue, doesn't it? I'm going to write leave a line. Obviously, you wouldn't do that, but because the tail of my G is in the way. The deer's image was a glistening silver statue. That's the end of my main clause, my sentence. I'm going to put some parenthesis on the end. I'm going to separate it with a comma. Because I want to explain how it was reflected in the lake. Reflected in the lake. Um... How could I describe the lake? The still waters of the lake. So remember we said, we're looking for powerful descriptive language in your writing, but it doesn't always have to be the most difficult, complicated words you can think of. Sometimes we can use quite simple words and they have a really strong, powerful effect. In the still waters of the lake. The deer's image was a glistening silver statue reflected in the still waters of the lake. Now, have I used a metaphor or a simile? Here's my description. This is what I'm comparing it to. A glistening silver statue. I think it's a metaphor because I've said that the deer was a glistening silver statue. It, it, it wasn't actually a statue, was it? But I'm comparing it to a statue because that's what it reminds me of. I could easily make that into a simile just by saying the deer's image was like a glistening silver statue. But in my sentence, I think the metaphor is a bit more powerful because I'm saying it was a statue. So it has more impact on the reader, I think. So have a go at the nasty writing today. Don't switch off now and then not do the rest of the writing lesson because um. I know that a lot of you are doing the nasty writing, but make sure you're also listening to my input for the rest of the writing lesson, because it will really help you to do your best writing in your story today. So, today we'll be drafting the second paragraph of our Diagon Alley, Diagon Alley narrative. You did the first paragraph on Friday. If you want to, you can re-watch the second video clip. I'll put the link on the Daily Learning page for you, which is all about visiting Gringotts Bank. I know in school, when we watched it, we watched up to 40 seconds, but then we actually watched the whole thing as well because it gave the children some ideas of some action they might want to include in their story. And we've talked a lot in school about using ideas from the film, um, but also making up your own plot lines. So adding some of your own details. So I know Summer in my class, for example, when we were planning, she said she was going to imagine that she went into the shop selling owls on Diagon Alley and something happened to her in the shop there. So that wasn't something we saw in the video clip but she's using an idea from the video clip and then taking it a bit further and making up her own story from that. So use your plan to help you and the writing checklist which is on the next slide. Remember you're not Harry Potter, you're you, it's your story. So you can invent some extra detail about what happens to you on your adventure. So I've got my success criteria here. It's the same as Friday today, so I'm not going to go through it all again. But a lot of it is about creating atmosphere, making the reader really know what it was like for me when I went to Diagon Alley. So I am going to show you how I would start my second paragraph where I'm walking into Gringotts Bank. And I, in my story, I'm imagining that I went to Diagon Alley with Hagrid. So I'm going to start by describing us walking into um, da uh, Gringotts Bank and contrasting really the atmosphere between the two settings because Diagon Alley was so noisy, busy, people rushing everywhere, people pushing and shoving and chattering and laughing and gossiping. And then I can just imagine as the heavy doors, these grand, huge doors of the bank slam shut behind you, it would be so different inside the bank. It, it, it was immensely uh, quiet. 
all these goblins beavering away over their work, or you could probably hear where the scratching of their pens, the rustling of their paper. So before I describe any action, I'm going to set that scene for the reader and create the atmosphere of the bank and how different it is to the atmosphere of Diagon Alley. So, as we walked through, oops, you really won't be able to see what I'm writing if I do it in yellow. <laughs> as we walked, and I'm going to describe us walking through. Remember, you need to use past tense because it's a story. As we walked through, now how could I describe the entrance of the bank so that the reader really gets? It's not just a normal high street bank with a normal door. It's this really grand, um, imposing, that's a good word. You can magpie any of my words, by the way. As we walked through the grand, imposing entrance of the bank, So how can I explain that the atmosphere was very different to the atmosphere outside? I think rather than going straight into describing the atmosphere of the bank, I'm going to explain to the reader that we left the atmosphere outside behind us. It all disappeared. So I'm going to say the rush, and that nice word that I said I liked the other day, and I have checked for spelling. Because if you remember, I couldn't remember off the top of my head whether it had two Bs or one. So you would do the same at home. You would underline it with a pencil and a ruler and check it later. We're doing an editing lesson later in the week. So don't worry at the time you're writing if um, you're not sure about your spelling. Don't let it slow you down is what I'm saying. As we walk through the grand imposing entrance of the bank, the rush and hubbub of the alley was left behind. So now the reader's thinking, why? What was it like inside the bank? So I'm kind of whetting the reader's appetite to read on. I'm just going to reread that because I'm not that happy with the choice of words here. Now I could um, just leave it and do it in my editing lesson, but sometimes when you just read the sentence back, you might make changes as you go. As we walk through the grand imposing entrance of the bank, oh, I need a comma there to separate my clauses. I can hear that when I'm reading. The rush and hubbub of the alley. I think those words need to be the other way around, don't you? There's not really a grammatical reason for it. I just think it sounds better. So the hubbub and rush of the alley was left behind. I still don't like it. I don't like the word rush. So I'm going to change this to hubbub. The hubbub. Oh, I know. Um, I could use a synonym for rush. And the word that's come into my head is hurry. And that's quite nice then, because I've used some alliteration. <sighs> um, the hubbub and hurry of the alley was left behind. I think that sounds so much better for the reader. It flows much more nicely. OK, so let's carry on. So now I've got to describe the atmosphere in the bank, haven't I? Now, I'm leaving a line just because I've written hurry here, but I wouldn't ordinarily leave a line in the middle of my paragraph. I'm going to start my sentence. I started here with as. I don't want to do that again. So I'm going to start with in front of us, that's front of adverbial, in front of us, and then I want to compare what I could see inside the bank, and I was to something else, and I was thinking that when Harry first walks into the bank with all the chandeliers and all the tiles and I think it looks like it's got marble everywhere. It reminded me of like um, a scene from a bank in sort of the 1920s or something. You know, like um, around the time, well, just after the time the Titanic um, set sail, because I think some of you might have learned about that in school. Um, that's what it reminds me of, like a really grand, um, old fashioned kind of scene from a bank from a um, hundred years ago, really. So I, I was going to compare it to like a scene from an old fashioned film or movie, I suppose you could say. I use the word film more often. In front of us, like a scene from an old fashioned film, there appeared, um, I want to describe the room, the space, the area I can see in front of me, the grandest, 
most luxurious. I don't know if luxurious is the right word, actually, because it's not luxurious in the way a hotel or something would be, would it? Is it? Because it's a bank. So I think I might use the word um, lavish. You can magpie any of these good words if you want to. Lavish means it's had a lot of money spent on it. Um, you know, it's not many banks have chandeliers dripping from the ceiling, do they? So there appeared the grandest, most lavish space I had ever seen, encountered, come across, experienced. Which word sounds better? I think I'm going to use encountered. In front of us, like a scene from an old fashioned film. So that's nice as well. I've got two front headed burglars there, haven't I? And a simile. In front of us, like a scene from an old fashioned film, there appeared the grandest, most lavish space I had ever encountered. It was a glistening, that's my word from my nasty writing, I like that, and I think it describes all the chandeliers really well. It was a glistening, actually I'm not going to have another adjective. Don't always think you've got to have two or three adjectives to make something descriptive, because sometimes it can sound too much. So I'm going to stick to one adjective and keep this quite a short sentence. It was a glistening palace. That's a metaphor really, isn't it? Because it's not a palace, it's a bank. At first, so what I'm going to say now, the reason I've written at first as my front of the proverbial is because I'm going to describe all the goblins hard at work. But I'm not just going to say there were loads of goblins doing their work. Um, I'm going to describe how I walked in. I was just amazed by all the chandeliers, all the marble, all the pillars. And then I heard the scratching of pens, the turning of paper, and that's what made me notice all the goblins around me. That's much more interesting for the reader. It's really talking them through my experience that I had, rather than just giving them everything straight away on a plate. So at first, I didn't notice the, shall I call them? Yes, I didn't know they were goblins straight away, I've decided, a bit like Harry. So I'm going to write First, I didn't notice the little creatures um, diligently. That means they were working really hard. So again, you can magpie that adverb if you like it. It means you're working really hard. Diligently slaving over their books. Now I'm going to try and go for one of the um, blue challenges here, the three chilli challenges on the checklist, and use a semicolon to separate my two sentences, because they are connected. The, I'm going to talk about what I could hear. Like I said to you, the only sound, I'm not going to write I could hear, I don't need to say that, do I? I could just say the only sound was the rustling of paper and the scratching of pens. I was going to say the only sound I could hear. But if I describe the sound, the reader knows I could hear it. I don't always need to put all these words in, do I? Oops, can I? Right, let's read that through all the way. Thanks for staying with me, because I think this will really help you um, with your second paragraph today. As we walk through the grand, imposing entrance of the bank, the hurry, the hubbub and hurry of the alley was left behind. In front of us, like a scene from an old-fashioned film, there appeared the grandest, most lavish space I had ever encountered. It was a glistening palace. At first, I didn't notice the little creatures diligently slaving over their books. The only sound was the rustling of paper and the scratching of pens. I've managed to get my semicolon in there. I've got some nice alliteration. I think I've started to use some powerful words and I'm also starting to talk about what I can see, what I can hear, so I'm thinking about all of my senses. I think it's a, an okay start. Um, at the moment it's pretty much based on what I could um, see and hear in the video, but I now might go on to explain how I got my money and it might be different to the way Harry got his money in the video, so you can decide that too. How do you get your money and what happens um, 
before you leave the bank to go and spend your money in Diagon Alley. Okay, have some fun with that today. Oh my goodness, I've just realised that video took 20 minutes. I'm sorry it was so long today, but hopefully that's given you lots of help for your writing today and you'll feel really confident about getting on with that. Okay then, um, take care, have a good day today and I'll see you again tomorrow.